mentors were Dr. Gerber and Dr. Kumbale, and then I actually prepared the uh, experiment here at the University of Toledo, where I'm from, and then went out to uh, the University of Reno uh, to do the experiment at the NCF facility that so we had at Terawatt. Uh, this is a video of a machine going off. Are we going to sound? I don't know if we're going to sound. Well, it's very loud, very fast. It's about 100 nanosecond discharge. Um, I'll show you the actually assemble the, the actual assembly here in a second. Um, so this is I have to mention this was not done at uh, NTF. This is the exact same machine, same setup, everything like that. But this was actually done when the machine was at Sandia instead of NTF. Um, this is before discharge. This is during discharge. Uh, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of lightning bolts coming off. This whole tank right here is filled with deionized water. And then there's a tank behind that with uh, the Mars Bay capacitors that are is filled with deionized uh, dielectric oil. Uh, this is the setup for it. Um, so this is the Mars Bay capacitors. These essentially charge, I think they have 36 capacitors up to about 80 kilovolts uh, in parallel. Then they have an automatic discharge switch um, that switches over to serial and everything gets dumped into this giant capacitor because they have to discharge the whole charge at the same time. So uh, coming out of these 36 capacitors, it's not going to exactly be at the same time, so they try to discharge it to a larger capacitor that then discharges it into the uh, actual load chamber. Uh, yeah, stored energy is at 150 kilojoules. Uh, PFL voltage is at 2.2 megavolts. Uh, load current is between 0.9 and 1 uh, mega amps, but I think they're actually running a little bit more than that, which is why that rise time is actually more than 70 seconds. Uh, I was actually attaching this onto uh, Ben Hamill, uh, he's a grad student over at uh, University of Reno, his main campaign. He was actually trying essentially to replace gas guns uh, with an electron beam, uh, which sounds kind of crazy. But when you think about the uh, amount of energy that we're pushing into this, uh, yeah, you end up seeing why. <laughs> um, so he wants to determine the reproducibility because no one's actually ever done uh, this kind of experiment, at least uh, as a shock experiment, to actually measure the shock wave. Uh, velocity off of whatever target you're hitting. Um, this is the final target. We're using uh, polycrystal copper. Uh, that one's about two millimeters thick, and you can see the uh, electron gleam blew about a two to three millimeter hole through the metal. <laughs> actually, I think that was a four, actually. Uh, four millimeters of copper. Um, the electron beam just completely went through it. And there's actually no warping on the total surface of the target, um, which kind of tells you that the electron beam is going at that 100 nanoseconds or slower or faster and uh, there's not a whole lot of heat transfer in between that and the target. Uh, this is the actual load that we're using. Um, this is one that I built. Uh, it's copper plate with a stainless steel anode on the bottom of it and then we have uh, the four tiny little wires that you can see in here. They're uh, 15 micron tungsten. And we're actually using uh, silver the uh, 20 micron silver for the entire time I went this time. Uh, the purpose of my study is essentially to determine um, symmetry, or the symmetry of the pulses and then the beam profile, or at least try to figure out the beam profile, figure out how the beam is actually hitting the copper uh, by x-ray dispersion. They also, the other problem is that we don't know what the peak energies of the x-rays coming out of the chamber or, or, or the peak energy of the electron beam itself. Um, they've been kind of working on it for 40 years, but there's really no electronics to be able to do it. Uh, because of that, we're using films. We're using uh, standard X-ray Biomax MS films. Um, this is my third trip to Reno, and we've been kind of tweaking how we're doing this each time. Uh, this time we decided to try and do like a transmission and absorption type of experiment. So we use, uh, this is a bismuth uh, kind of wedge, and then that one's a tungsten one that I made. Um, these steps right here are millimeter, and they're five uh, millimeters in width. And then uh, the total thickness of the bismuth was uh, two centimeters. The total thickness of the uh, tungsten was only uh, two millimeters. But tungsten has a lot more absorption and transmission is a lot less. So uh, we kind of adjusted the 
transitioning to the source to account for the change of material. But I'm essentially using the tungsten and the bismuth as two separate experiments to try and verify one another. Uh, this was the films that we got off of it. Um, the curves, they're about what we expected and what we wanted, actually, which is a surprise for this experiment because you never know what you, what you wanted out of it. Um, this is the tungsten, which is on the right. This one's for the bismuth, which is on the left. Um, the tungsten, you can see the steps a lot more clearly than what you can in this bismuth. Um, that was a little surprising at first, but then we figured out that our distances were quite blurry on uh, some of the beginning tests. Um, so we adjusted that. Uh, these are just the, I have to scan a couple more films yet because uh, I have to use a high resolution scanner so I have to get access to it. Um, so I don't have all the data sets as of yet. But uh, the interesting part is that the slopes are relatively the same. One of them is more linear than the other. But um, that's actually mostly because of the scattering factors inside of the bismuth. The bismuth, the, the, uh, the packing density isn't as high, but the atomic radius is a lot higher, so you're going to get a little bit more constant scattering and stuff, which is kind of to be expected, which is why it's more a little more exponential as you get, because this is the thicker. Uh, this is the thinner size. This is the thicker size. Same thing on the tungsten. So as you get thicker and as you get thinner, then you're going to have a little bit different scattering patterns through it. Uh, which is why I think that it's more exponential than the other one, but I think that's just the way that the curve went, I guess. Um, but the tungsten, you can definitely see this. The, uh, there's, uh, this is distance in millimeters from light to dark. Um, so the lighter films, uh, by the way, this is calibrated in EB2 film. So uh, at the light side of the tungsten, we virtually got nothing, which is really what we wanted because the biggest part of this is trying to find the peak energy of the beam and the peak energy of the uh, x-rays they actually get out of the chamber and because we have this where it's essentially nothing and then starting to grow from there we essentially hit the bottom side of the curve so we know what the peak energy is now or at least a roundabout because each experiment is pretty well different um, so we figured out the, meet of, the minimum energy of the peak coming out uh, out of the chamber is about 4 MeV which is a lot higher than when I originally came there when they told me that it was about 100 kV um, it's the peak itself. Uh, the lower energy, the lower energy X-ray stuff isn't very symmetrical. It's pretty much all over the place. So if you have bare films out and you set them, you know, radially around the source, one could be dark and got a lot of exposure, and then the one next to it could be absolutely no exposure. And we tested that several times in several positions and found out that, that was completely true. But the peak energy, however seems to be pretty symmetric. We had the bismuth on one side and then the uh, tungsten directly across from it, and they were actually pretty well the same, um, which was surprising to us considering uh, the lower energy, the lower energy X-ray stuff that we've gotten. Um, based off Ben's data um, from the shock waves and then kind of judging uh, how much energy we actually got on our films, we actually found out that there is some sort of a correlation in between the X-ray energy coming out and the actual shock wave velocity. Um, which we're still trying to investigate that because we don't exactly know why there's a correlation. Um, but we expect that there to be some sort of a correlation in between either the lower energy x-rays and the higher energy or the shock wave. In, uh, so essentially how much energy is getting deposited into the copper. Because uh, I don't know if anybody knows how x-ray machines work, but uh, it's essentially an electron beam hitting a copper plate, which is exactly what we have. So if you're depositing more energy in the copper, you're getting more x-rays out. So we're thinking that's probably a little bit of what it is. That also kind of creates a problem with the conservation um, of the whole experiment because then if you're pumping out more x-rays, then you kind of lose energy in the beam. So we don't exactly know why there's some shots that have not a whole lot of x-ray and then the shock velocity is a little lower. But then we run the exact same experiment, the exact same way, the same variables, everything else like that, and then get a ridiculously tired amount or something. Um, also, uh, because we're actually getting results this time, we figured out that this would be a cheap method to be able to study these hard x-rays and these fast sources, because as of right now, there's not, at least of what I can find, unless you're about to spend by $5 million or so, there's no electronics to go this fast to be able to get the energy resolution that you need in time. So, uh, yeah, uh, this would be a very good way to actually study these things that aren't really studied all that much. Um, going forward, uh, we're debating on whether or not to do alternative designs for these 
uh, business plates and stuff, make them a little thicker, or uh, maybe change the container a little bit so it's a little bit more stable. Um, we're going to combine the data sets with the other x-ray detectors that they had. Um, he had an R, uh, liquid A detector that detects hard x-rays from about 100 kV to 300 kV. And then we also had a five-channel filter that had boron filters and stuff like that that measures the lower energy x-rays. And then uh, street cameras, because he's actually using a street camera um, on his visor system, which is what measures the shock wave. Uh, so we might be able to pull some data out of that, too. Um, we also have to calibrate this film using standard source yet. Um, there is an absolute calibration on the film itself. That's how we got the, uh, uh, that's how I transmitted those graphs in the EV. But the, just the, I don't know, the, the way that our source is, when they're using a standard source for their calibration, and then we just have the source that essentially has a whole mess of everything coming out at it, I just would feel a lot better if I did it myself. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, creating a Monte Carlo simulation to be able to uh, reproduce the results because no one's actually ever done anything like this before, so we have to have something to kind of correlate it to. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Tom Cavalli, Dr. Rick Irving, uh, the staff at NTF, and staff here at the Physics Astronomy Department, also UTMC for letting me use their toys, uh, Linda Oni, and the uh, RU grant. And then Any questions for Alex? Yeah, Dave. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm confused by the, the peak. You're looking for the peak energy, X-ray. Yeah. Uh, and you were saying that the, the fat end of your, mm -hmm. your detector. The fat end of the light side of those. But uh, and, and you're getting nothing through. Um, on the tungsten, no. Pretty much but, we're not. But that's. That would, uh, it seems to me, telling you about the, I don't know, the, the peak is the, well, because we're getting, it's confusing. Me. Well, because we're getting everything, the peak energy we're looking at as the highest x-ray energy coming out of the chamber. So if we can essentially block that, and then on the next step, get a little bit, like we did on the tungsten, then we can essentially say this is the lower limit for the outcoming x-rays, because this is what got absorbed and transmitted after we calculate all that data, and then say, Okay, well, we didn't get anything passed through this, so we essentially blocked everything. And then on the next one, there was a little bit that came in, so then we can kind of get a roundabout. Essentially using the transmission and the absorption to figure out what the energy that could pass through that amount of material is. So you said there was a correlation between peak energy and shock wave. Yeah, um, the, the lower energy X-ray is not so much, like the amount and the intensity and energies and stuff. We have the energy values for that off the five channels. Um, but the lower energy x-rays are pretty much all over the place with the shock values, but then what we were getting on here, whenever we had a harder shot that was a lot darker, the shock uh, velocity was a lot higher. So we were pumping more energy into the copper when we had darker films. I guess my question is, what is the range of values, this correlation, what is the range of values of the peak energy, and what causes it to change? That we're not sure of. The range of energies, we have a lower limit at 4 MeV, the outside stuff, Beam energy, we don't have really any grasp on yet because they have to run through simulations and all that stuff. And it's a lot harder to determine simply because of conservation and you know there's scattering everywhere and um, be just variations in the wires. They think that, but then again, they run fishing line through this and got the same thing. <laughs> so there's a certain mass that you have to have inside the uh, the load to be able to get it to do any sort of a pinch anyway. But um, and then it doesn't seem to be. There's not a whole lot of things that you can change. Like you can coat the wires in oil and you still get x-rays out. You can you know, put fishing line in there and still get it out. You can put tungsten, copper, palladium, it doesn't matter. You can put anything in there and essentially get around the same results as long as the mass is the same. So any of the outside variables, really you can change essentially everything and it doesn't matter. And the mass of the wire? No, like the mass of the, the, mass of the total load, like um, whatever you, that's why I was saying in this, um, before we were using 15 micron uh, tungsten, and then we went to 20 micron silver because it's lower mass to it. So we had to increase the diameter of the, the wires. Atomic mass. We did the atomic, atomic mass. mass. So the total mass of the wires is, the, the, the total mass of all four wires ends up being the same. But then you have to change the diameter, which we don't know whether or not that really changes a whole lot. Because that has to do with 
how fast the current's actually getting through the wires to the copper. And then, because this section where it crosses, uh, this is a 180 degree twist inside of it, uh, that pretty much goes away as soon as the current comes into the wire, and then you have infinite resistance inside of the plates, and that's how you get the electron being shut up. So, but I, mean, I guess my question was about the variation in peak energy, how much it varies. You said it it varies energy. widely. Uh, so we had some... It has to be a factor of 10, or two. It's probably a factor of 10. Oh. It, it, we had some films that, by the end of it, they were completely not exposed, like to the point that it wouldn't even show up to the DVD. It was clear, like you had taken out of the package. <laughs> and then we had some that were... We actually had, like, the curve started around... 2 EV or so. So, I mean, there's probably a factor of 10 going through there every time. I mean, it, it is really dependent on essentially how the current's going to discharge out the things, I think. Which creates problems for doing experiments like this. Andy? So, your detector, your film, is, of course, designed to be sensitive only to these high energy x rays, mm -hmm. right? Well, it's actually lower energy x rays. There isn't higher energy x ray film. So, that's why we're using this transmission to be able to do it because they don't have stuff that will, because essentially anything, if I, I put a film out in front of it by itself without anything in front of it, then everything over top of 100 kV would go right through the film, it wouldn't even leave it, it wouldn't even see it. So, so you're looking at secondary. Yeah, secondary scan things. Yeah. Which is actually why, if you, I don't know if you can see it all that well. Actually, it's pretty visible on the tongue stand. You can see in here there's these darker or lighter spots right around the edges. There's these darker, lighter spikes right on the edges right here, and that's probably what that is from. You're going from one thickness to Yeah, going into one thickness to the other right around the edge, and you get a little bit more scattering. Which, these graphs are uh, averages of the entire surface of the film. So it's, yeah. Well, the entire surface of, like right here, you can see the edge of the business. So I just took the this one. But, the, so the, a lot of the effect might be due to the fact that the secondary stuff can't get out with the thick, where your absorber is thicker. Yeah. yeah, and we have to compensate for that. That's a lot of why the Monte Carlo is going to come into play, because we're going to have to figure out like where the secondary scattering was, how much of it there was, and what the energies of it was. Cause, um, that's kind of why I switched from using, because originally we were using lead as a uh, filter for it, but then we uh, were thinking we were getting a lot of hair production off of it because it was their films. So that's why we switched over to this one. So. How, how often can you do these experiments? Uh, you can run on a good day five. Oh. Um, so, it, I mean, it's, you know, not super fast where you're running it, you know, 20, 30 times a day and you're getting a bunch of data, but typically as long as the machine's running good, you can get four or five a day. It takes a while to set up and get back down the back because you got to change the load out of the time. All right. Well, let's thank Alex again.